Shalom, shalom, friends. I'm here with Rabbi David Rosen, AJC's International Director of Interreligious Affairs, who has been advancing understanding and good relations between religious communities for more than 40 years, from the time he served as rabbi of the largest Orthodox Jewish congregation in South Africa, during his tenure as Chief Rabbi of Ireland, and throughout the last more than 30 years based in Jerusalem. In addition to interreligious representation and education, his work involves mediation and peace building, and he's heavily involved in multi-religious engagement on ecological issues. Among the various awards and recognition he's received, Rabbi Rosen was granted a papal knighthood in 2005 with his contribution to Jewish Catholic reconciliation and 2010, and he was made a CBE commander of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II for his work promoting interfaith understanding and cooperate, uh, cooperation. Thank you, Rabbi Rosen, for taking time to talk today. Thank you, Rabbi Shmuley, lovely to be with you. So Thank that means that if there's a war between Britain and the Vatican, I have to stay at home because I can't defend either. <laughs> uh, okay, to, so to jump right in here, um, religion is often seen, as you know, as the cause of much conflict, as it is, with movements such as Kach and ISIS, often featured prominently in the media. But I wonder, what potential do you see religion having to make the world a better place? Well, let me say, first of all, I don't want to let religion off the hook. You're certainly right that religion has been badly abused or, or has often abused itself in the course of history. But I would say the vast majority of conflicts are identified as religious conflicts are, are nothing of the sort. And the vast majority of abuse in the name of religion is essentially uh, exploiting religion for specific purposes, but is stemming from something far more profound, if you like, spiritually and psychologically. Uh, with regards to conflicts um, of, uh, between in regions and in countries or between countries where religion is uh, exploited. This is obviously, this is off, more often than not related to the fact that religion is, inextric is inextricably bound up with people's identities. Uh, identity gives us an understanding of whom we are and religion seeks to give meaning to our understanding of who we are. And therefore, when people feel threatened, they turn to religion, as we see with regards to the prophets of Israel, to provide succor, a sense of meaning and purpose, not to feel that they are totally abandoned and neglected. Mm -hmm. The tragedy is that identity tells us not only who we are, but also who we are not. And in that process, very often when we feel that our identity is threatened, we turn to religion not only for self-justification, but tragically all too often to denigrate the other in order to reinforce our own claims. And there, very often, religion then betrays its mate here by being exploited in a destructive manner. I think also with regards to individual and individual groups, when there is the violent abuse of religion, it almost always reflects some form of alienation. As indeed, probably it's fair to say that all violence reflects some form of alienation, uh, at least the vast majority of it. So that people utilize this in order to be able to, to like cover up, reinforce, protect, justify, give, a sense of legitimacy. We have a terrible phenomenon here in Israel that almost every criminal you see on the TV screen being arrested or arraigned before the courts puts on a kippah as to somehow that exonerates the individual from their terrible offenses and makes them okay. This is a classic example of where religion is simply exploited in order to be able to provide justification for people who always believe that they have been unfairly treated in one way or another. So I think the important thing is to be able to understand the root causes of these dimensions and to understand that if you have a phenomenon like the mafia, that doesn't mean that family bonds are bad. It means that simply they've been exploited in a destructive manner. If you have gluttony, that doesn't mean that food is bad. It means you've got to know how to be able to use it or be able to benefit from it in a manner that ennobles and raises the individual up. And I think that's the challenge with regards to the abuse of religion generally. So we have to make religion aware we have to bring the awareness to people's consciousness of the power of religion to ennoble and utilize the examples that we can find of that ennoblement to inspire people to see the enormous resource beauty and uh, inspiration that religion can provide what well, beautiful so how do we talk today about the importance of difference and of unity um, and what are the big uh, tension points there today on navigating those two well, I think the metaphor, a very useful metaphor, again, is the metaphor of family. And uh, in a family, 
if you are a parent, you want to encourage your children's individuality or at least to develop their potential. And yet at the same time to nurture their sense that they are part of a unit. In other words, these must not be seen as in conflict with one another, but critically complementary and in supportive for one another. So the, the unity is the bigger picture. The particularity is within that. And I would go so far as to say that only a universalism that comes out of our particularities is really sustainable. I'm sure that John Lennon was very positively motivated when in his song, Imagine, he said, imagine no more countries, it isn't hard to do, nothing to live and die for, or no religion to. But the truth is, if you reduce people to their lowest common denominator in order to be able to have that unity, you are left with a vacuity that is easily exploitable and uh, uh, manipulative, uh, manipulated by extremists and by cults, by all different elements. It's only when identities are profound and stable that they can truly contribute to a truly more universal world where that unity is made up of those various diversities. And of course, we can use the banal metaphors of gardens and of flowers and all the colors. So diversity is a manifestation of creation and God has created us in all that diversity. Therefore, there is, if you like, an impulse. The Quran has a beautiful line, message in this regard in chapter 49, verse 13 of the Quran. Oh, humankind, we've created you from a single male and female and made you into tribes and nations in order that you may know one another. In other words, it's difference that enables us to discover the greater beauty, complexity, and glory of God's creation. Beautiful. So at, at an earlier stage in your career, you primarily focused on the difference piece, the particularism. And I wonder what inspired you towards the latter piece? What inspired you to embark on a career in interfaith relations and dialogue where we work on, on respecting that difference and harnessing that unity? My father was a very famous rabbi in Britain. Uh, his name was Rabbi Koppel Rosen. He died when I was only 10 years old. And uh, as I get old, as I've got older, uh, I've realized more and more how much though that first decade of my life, or even less than it, if you like, maybe seven years of real consciousness, have completely molded who and what I am today. Right. I grew up in a home that was deeply rooted within Jewish orthodoxy, but truly open and engaged with the world at large. And I was raised to believe that that was the right way to be a, a, an authentic Jew, not to be isolated from my world, but to be engaged with it. And how I got into the rabbinate is a story in and of itself, but I never ever felt that within my rabbinate, I was isolated from the world around me. On the contrary, in South Africa, I was expelled from that country precisely because during the era of apartheid, I was engaged with a broader environment because I believe that a religion that doesn't relate to the issues around it isn't worthy of the name. Right. So I've never been if you like, caught in any sense of dichotomy between my Jewish particularity and my human universality. Wow, amazing. Um, what's a piece of Torah, a piece of Jewish wisdom that, that among, among the many that animates and inspires you to do the work you do? I suppose um, one of the greatest sources of inspiration for me is the Korban Aharon, the commentary on the Sifra, 17th century, I think, commentary, who gives us the insight into the fullness of the famous discussion between Rabbi Akiva and Ben Azai. The discussion with regards to Rabbi Akiva and Ben Azai of the Klal Gadol Batorah, I think, appears in three places, at least two Midrashic, the Sifra, the Bereshit Rabbah, and I think in Yerushalmi, perhaps as elsewhere. But it's fragmentary in virtually every single place. Uh, in uh, the uh, obviously in the in the Sifra it starts with a text that comes from Vayikra, which is after the Reach HaKavocha. In Bereshit Rabbi it starts Ze Sefer Toldot Adam. This is the generation of creation of the man because that's the verse as it appears in that particular portion. But the Korban Aharon explains the whole discussion in its entirety in the original text, and therefore it reads uh, as he indicates as follows: um, Rabbi Akiva said. Uh, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the great principle of the Torah. Ben Azai says, This is the generations of man when God created them, male and female, he created them and called their name Adam in the day he created them. In other words, the very fact of the human being created in the divine image is a greater principle than that of you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then the text continues, says, Rabbi, uh, uh, Lest you say, because I was cursed, so let my neighbor be cursed. Because I was despised, so let my neighbor 
be despised. In other words, it's clear from the, uh, the logic of the text that this is, these words are not the words of Akiva, but the words of Ben Azai, who is adding them to his principle of the fact that the human being is created in the divine image. So don't say this person is my neighbor, the other is a neighbor, or, or because of what's happened to me and my subjective experience, therefore I must behave to the other accordingly. In other words, don't say, Love my neighbor as myself means love my neighbor to the extent that I have been loved. And if I have not been loved, then I don't need to love my neighbor. No, says Ben Azai. The very fact that the human being is created in the divine image means that you need to love them. And therefore, you need to respect their dignity. And then comes the punchline with the words of Rabbi Tanfuma. If you did so and said, because I've been humiliated, so let the other be humiliated. Because I've been despised, let the other despise. Know who it is you despise because in the image of God, he created a human being. In other words, any act of disrespect against another human being is an act of disrespect against God. Any Jew who behaves in a disparaging manner towards another human being is to behaving disparagingly towards God. There is no greater travesty than that. So only when we relate to other human beings, all human beings, out of the sense of the divine image in which every single one is created, are we truly, authentically Jewish in keeping with the way that Allah wants us to be? Wow. Wow. Oh, okay, my last question for you. Um, as one concerned with social justice and as a committed ethical vegan, how do you weave these moral concerns into your dialogue work? I don't need to weave them. They're so obviously compelling to me. If I love God, as actually this is hardly original, this is the Maharal. Um, this is the Maharal who says, if you truly love God, you must love God's creation and God's creatures. If you don't truly love God's creatures and God's creation, you don't truly love God. Therefore, obviously, this means that I must have a cosmological and environmental and eco-responsibility towards my environment, towards animals, sentient beings. And even if I have Sentient beings are not on the level of human beings. Nevertheless, I'm obliged to treat them with compassion and care. And in today's world, especially in terms of the livestock industry, as well as environmental issues, it's not possible to be consonant with the sublime Jewish ethical values and be anything other than a vegan. In other words, following a diet that's based on plant consumption and not on the exploitation, let alone the enormity of suffering that is caused to animals in our world. Beautiful. Thank you, Rabbi Rosen. You've been so instrumental to me in my journey and, and, and uh, as a teacher and mentor and to countless around the world, I often say uh, you are our strongest Jewish uh, ambassador around the world. And it's, uh, it's a great honor to have this time with you. Thank you so much. My honor to be associated with you. Thank you for all you do.